Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to dive into PFSense firewall rules, some basics, and some troubleshooting tips. Because, well, they aren't that hard once you know them, but of course, that's always the learning curve. Uh, what seems to be easy, or when people say, oh, that seems so obvious now, is because there's a few knowledge gaps. So my goal right now is to bridge some of those knowledge gaps. Now, the good news is, what I talk about here are general firewall rules and may apply to more than just PFSense. So some of this is just some general network engineering, the concepts of firewalls, how the rules and how traffic gets passed or stopped is you know, fairly the same. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, during this about those differences. Uh, PFSense is uh, my favorite firewall as anyone who's watched this channel knows. Uh, so that's why I'm covering it specifically with PFSense. But as I said, these general rules are going to apply more than to just PFSense. But this hopefully gives you a good idea of how it works, how you can do some troubleshooting and how to dig through some of the logs and a couple of the utilities. All of this is built into PFSense uh, to be able to troubleshoot this so you can figure out why something is or is not working. Before we dive dive into that, let's first. If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free, and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now back to our content. I, I am running this in my virtual lab for simplicity because the number of connections on our primary PF sense, well, they're extensive and sorting through a lot of connections um, is where you want to scale up to. But when you're sorting out with a few connections, it makes it a lot easier to get started. So my lab here, my main server is 192.168.3.152. And my laptop that I'm using to access it is on the WAN side. So we've opened up a port. Normally you're gonna be doing this, more than likely at least, from the inside of the network. And by default, PFSense does not have any ports open. The defaults are very secure with PFSense, nothing's open. So we did change the default to open up the WAN in order for me to access it from my laptop. Now my laptop is, this is at 3.152 and my laptop is at 3.18. So you'll see that reference quite a bit. Just wanna get that out of the way first. And then we have in the back end of the lab here, this, and this is my Debian box that is behind the PFSense. This is all attached via virtual network adapters. I have whole videos on using XCPNG and getting started for building a virtual lab for this. So it has an IP address of 192.168.40.129. So this is the box that's going to be, or server host that's going to be behind the PFSense that we'll be doing all the testing on. They do have documentation, of course, at the uh, NetGate docs, and I'll leave a link to this. It's just the firewall rule basics that they're gonna dive into a few uh, other pieces. I wanna get you started with the basics, but there's actually quite a bit in here. Um, and one thing of note, and this is where it applies to perhaps other firewalls, is floating rules. Now, PFSense takes for each network interface you have and creates a firewall tab. So when you go over to the rules tab, you have for each created interface, a tab that's generated, including, I don't have one in here, but OpenVPN. So uh, that is where the rules start. Now, the default when you create a new interface is no rules and will pass no traffic. This is actually the first troubleshooting tip is every time you create an interface, you have to at least create a pass rule to pass traffic because the default is not. So this is the um, actually out of the box default for LAN. The default allow LAN to any rule because the LAN by default gets access to everything. Now, the reason I brought up floating rules is some firewalls uh, don't use the term floating rule. Now, floating rule means rules that can apply in a broader sense to all interfaces with both directions. It's kind of an interesting advanced inside of PFSense, but some firewalls, that's how all rules are treated in one giant page. And there can be arguments made back and forth for this. I prefer the method that PFSense and other firewall companies have chose where they create a list and you apply rules on a per interface. You still have an option to universally apply rules, but for doing large networks, and we've dealt with some of the firewalls, that just dump it all on one page. Some people are like, well, you get this one single pane view. And I'm like, but you also have to 
uh, have this large view every time you're trying to sort something out. So it becomes a little more complicated. I like that the rules are there. So uh, debate that all you want. This is how it is in PF Sense, but that is what the floating rules are. And yes, you could create any of these rules as floating, but there's actually floating is more advanced. When I did my video, and you can search this on my channel for Coddle Q, you create that as a floating rule so it will apply to all interface. That's an example of when to use it. There's other times like when I do the uh, whole VPN rule when you want to take everything and wrap it in a VPN. That's a floating rule, so you can apply it to multiple interfaces, including my VPN kill switch video. Once again, floating rule, so it doesn't matter what interface it applies to. All right, back to the firewall basics here. The friend of the firewall basics is the logs. Not enough people stop. I, that's the first question you're going to ask. Every time you are new to PF Sensing, you post, hey, I can't get this to work. You almost immediately see someone go, where's your logs? And a lot of times you find the answer in the logs. Now, one thing I've done from default, and we're going to open this up in a new tab. Uh, I like this log shown in reverse entry, and the default is 50, and I usually change it to 100. That's just so it lists out the logs a little bit longer. So here's show log entries in reverse order, newest entries at the top. I wish that was the default. That is uh, at least something I should um, say that I do change all the time. That just makes it easier when I look at something and get a view. And we'll actually we'll just click it first without filtering. And there's your normal view and all the log information's at the top. Now default, it's, all, it's also only going to be showing the firewall rules. Firewall rules, it logs the denies, but it doesn't log the past. You can change that and we'll, uh, there's a little checkbox when you're creating a rule. So we'll talk about that when we get to the rule creation. But at the top here is a little filter. And we wanna filter it to only things coming from my laptop, which is at 3.18. We could also do uh, the other side, like destination IP address, what is the internal address. So we mentioned, and uh, right here is the, I'm um, SSH'd into it. So here's that 192.168.41.29. That's the Debian box I have. And we could also, you know, look at rules related to that. And I believe if we do this, I don't know if there's anything in there right now. Yeah, probably not. It's not, de it's not been denied anything, but this is where you're going to be able to go through, uh, look for pass block. Now by default, all the rules, it's only logging the block. If you do choose to log pass one, it does take up more resources to be able to dump these in here. Um, so that's why it doesn't do it by default because, well, you don't need all that logged, but you could also do that for troubleshooting purposes. All right. So let's go ahead and go ahead and look at the rules themselves. So close that one. So we'll take a look here at the WAN. Now these are all rules I created. I have it on port 555, as you can see at the top. So I created a WAN rule to allow 555. I was playing with dark stats, so that's why 666 is open. And 222 is going directly to the firewall. And this is an auto generate rule from NAT. There's our IP address of the server. So you know, I'm setting the destination to be this firewall, this firewall, which means land on the firewall's WAN IP address. If it has multiple, you can choose that. Um, and for here, we have a rule for uh, landing on port 22 and then NAT. Now, I'll cover briefly NAT. I have a separate video on how to do NAT, but when you do NAT, that's under a separate tab. NAT is actually really easy in PF Sense because it auto creates the rule. A lot of firewalls keep NAT separate and make you create the rules separate. And this is kind of an annoyance. Now, the, the home and consumer stuff doesn't do this, but a lot of the commercial stuff do. First, you create a NAT translation rule that means hit this public side of the IP address and bring it to this private side of the IP address, and then you have to create a rule as well as a NAT translation. So the NAT translation is the redirect, then the filter rule is the rule that says, all right, it comes here and allow it to go there. So we'll edit this rule real quick and just walk through it. So interface WAN, if we had more interfaces, you just pull down, protocol was TCP. Destination WAN address, if there was more than one address, you could choose that, like if there was multiple public IPs. You can say destination range, this is port 22 for SSH. Then we have the IP address, 192.168.40.129, that's our Debian server back there. Redirected port. Now this is a nice feature. What port it comes in on and what port it lands on can be different. Generally they're the same. If you have a web server on port 80 on the internal side and you have it on a different port uh, there, it can be different, but generally they're the same, It's but it does allow for that as a use case. It also does ranges. And just so you know, when you're doing the range right here, if I start at 22 and put 30 here, it starts at whatever number I start here and automatically, that's why there's not a second part, automatically adds those other ranges. So if you're forwarding a range of ad, uh, ports, it does allow that. I put a description in and it automatically creates the filter rule. This is what I was talking about for the filter rule. And here you can hit view rule and I'm pivoted over to it. And that's that rule that's 
auto-generated when you create a new NAT rule for that. So that's how those rules get in there. Like I said, I have a separate video where I cover NAT a little bit more in depth. Now let's look at the LAMP. This is the default anti-lockout rule. And what these are is to keep you from um, locking yourself out of the PFSense. It's expected that you're going to admin PFSense from the WAN. So by default, PFSense opens up the LAN addresses and allows you to get into the firewall. So that's what we have an 80 as a redirect rule. That way when you hit port 80, it redirects to whatever port uh, you've moved it to or left it at default, which is 443. I do prefer to move it to a different port. We use 555 in this case for the web interface that we're looking at right now. Uh, 222 happens to be the SSH interface. So from the LAN side, we can SSH into the 222. Now it does have the option to turn on um, you know, blocking and things like that. And I have it open externally, but it's going to apply the blocking such as too many user attempts and things like that uh, for specifically admin of the firewall via SSH. That is not open by default on the WAN, but when you open it, you can turn on the blocking on there and I won't get too in depth on that, but this is why it's called anti-lockout rule. And you noticed there's not anything you can do, but go to the settings page. And if you would like to disable uh, the anti-lockouts that's right here. So those rules generally are left at default and perfectly fine because we assume LAN's admin. Now, when I created LAN2, and I have a whole thing about creating interfaces, there was no rules on here. So we created a couple rules. Well, this one's technically wrong. Um, I have it blocking at 443. So let's fix that real quick. And what this does is by default, when you create an allow rule, it is allowed to talk to the firewall. That may be a problem because if you want this to be, let's say a guest network, Three, four. All right, block access to firewall interface. And because I changed the port, all right, save, apply. What that means is anything on LAN 2 has now been denied access to port 555. What that does for you is say, all right, here's LAN 2, it's our guest network, and we don't want it to access the web interface on the particular machine. Matter of fact, I should, if I were going to be more security conscious, we can create another rule that says block. So we'll actually do that real quick. We want to block TCP 666, 666, block access to dark stat. I know I have dark stat set up on here on port 666 and it's listening on the firewall port. So this now will block access to that. Now the rules are top down. So if I were to do this and then hit save, apply, what I have now done is it's going to say, hey, you can do whatever as long as you're not matching LAN net. So this particular rule says allow traffic, but don't allow it to LAN. So that's what the invert matches. Let me just show. So action pass, interface LAN2, address family, IPv4, protocol any. Make sure, because when you create a rule by default, uh, it defaults to protocol TCP. So change it to any, because this is another problem a lot of people are into when they create a rule to allow traffic. They don't change it to protocol any. They'll only have TCP. Well, that actually means it'll partially work. Some things will work, but not all things. And the reason why any TCP protocols will work, but all the other ones will start failing. But now what we've done is the destination, as long as it's not LAN net. Now, another option in here, if you have a series of addresses, you can put aliases. In the terms of guest network, you can put like a list of RFC 1918 addresses, like you can just block all private addresses. So a couple different options there. I have a separate video as well on how to set up and build like a secure network. And that's one of the ways I say to do it. Um, I'll leave a link to that down below as well. So I have a lot of different topics on this. So I don't have to dive too deep into those. So the top down and this is a lot of traffic. And this is that log packets that are handled by this rule. That is the default is not checked, but that's what will fill things up in the log, which is great for troubleshooting. Um, bad if you don't have enough storage. So uh, use that wisely in terms of, you know, how much you want to have dedicated to that. But important thing is that this one needs to be on the bottom. We need all of the block rules to be starting at the top. So deny, deny, you can't go there, you can't go there. Once it gets past those things to confirm that that host is not trying to access the things that it's not allowed to access, then it hits the allow rule. So that's why the rules are in that order. Now, a couple little side notes here is block rules. You can easily create this and then we'll say, add another separator. 
allow rules. Now you don't have to do this. These are just separators that just look pretty. Um, but when you're dealing with large networks, it does help. We've got some companies with a lot of a lot of port forwards and a lot of special rules in place. Now, because of that, you have this, um, well, too many rules to look at to make it easy. So we group them all together because each one's related to a different property they manage and certain ports that need to be forwarded for different things. Uh, so it's kind of nice to be able to do that. This is the um, little dividers are certainly something to give you a visual appeal when you're setting up firewalls. And it's a feature that I'll note, it doesn't make any functional difference. It's just a uh, separator literally to make it a little bit easier. Now let's look at the firewall rules on LAN where we'll do a little bit of testing and troubleshooting. So we have this that says the defaults allow to any rule. Now that means it can go wherever it wants. We can see all the states in there. So the state details. Now what a state is, is anytime the host connects through the firewall, it has to create a state. And that state, it'll tell you how many creations it has, how many things you're doing on there. And you can click it and look at the specifically the state tables related to that and filter them. Much better than filtering that where you want to watch things a little better would be watching it under PF top. So this is under diagnostics PF top. And I've covered this in my troubleshooting video for PF sense. So if we just say we're going to say just this host, I want to see what states this particular host has and what it what's going on. And because I'm SSH into it, you can see and we, if I, even if I exit out, you have these states. So you have 192.168.40.129 port 123, it's reaching out to a time server, 3.18, my laptop, and it's connecting in and landing on port 22. And you can see that this has now changed to a wait state because it's getting ready to close. Now the state tables, if we're gonna go ahead and SSH back into them, now we have active ones. So we have establish, establish. This is your Excellent tool for troubleshooting what might be happening with any particular rules. So whether or not those rules are working, whether or not things are coming across. I could filter, right now we're filtering for this host here, but we could also change it and say 192.168.3.18, and we can see what is the host on the outside doing. So you can use this with public IP address, private IP addresses, but this is one of the ways you can try to look at and try to figure out what the rules are doing. If you see nothing in here, and that means there's no traffic passing between the firewall, that's an other indicator of why something isn't working. You may have been too um, aggressive with your blocking rules and you've now blocked it from even getting out. People are like, well, it's not seeing connection. Is it the server or is it PF sense causing a problem? That's where you would probably want to start here at PF top. Is it creating an established state and losing it? Is the state dropping? What's happening? Now, another note I'll make about rules, and this is another point of confusion that sometimes happens. So if we go over here, we're going to go firewall rules. LAN. So we have the default allow rule and we can even go here like in NAT. So this NAT rule says WAN address and allow SSH, allow me to SSH into that virtual machine behind there. And there's of course the associated rule under firewall rules WAN. So here we go, allow remote access. Now I can edit these rules and we'll start editing them at the NAT level. Well, we can edit them either way. We'll just, we're just gonna turn it off essentially. So we're gonna go here and NAT allow VM. So if you click it, now it's grayed out. We just took that rule down. But go back over here, we still see established. We go over here to terminal. Hey, look, I can still um, get in here. I didn't stop my access. This is an important aspect of the way state tables are created. When you now have blocked, I've told PFSense, that's it, that rule is dead, you can't SSH back into this machine. But it does not automatically clear existing established state tables. So when we look over here, we see these established state tables and let's go ahead and uh, exit. Try to SSH back in, it won't let me. And now we'll see the ease go to, they're getting ready to close, they're at fin wait. So now this one's getting ready to close and it'll go away. This is one of those really important troubleshooting things of when you change a rule to stop something from happening, but you still see it happening, it, you have to look if there's any established rules. This is an important concept in there. So they will not automatically be cleared. Now they can be cleared because you can go over to diagnostics, states, and you can even filter for that particular one. Filter. And we could actually forcibly, we're just gonna clear these states right here. Are you sure you wanna clear this state? Yep. I sure run clear state. Now you can actually go in and reset 
all states, and that can just be a headache. That'll just stop everything. Uh, that's like an emergency move. You don't necessarily want to do that, uh, but it is an option there. So you can actually just drop all the state tables, kill all the states, kill the filtered states uh, with this right here. Matter of fact, just I, uh, if you kill, kill them, it'll also, if you're connected to web interface, pause while your system reestablishes all the states for that. So that's kind of um, a good way to understand the state tables is once they're existing, they don't automatically die, but you can just nuke them, so to speak, without rebooting the firewall. But that's very disruptive to your users. That's the part to remember. They will reestablish, but if there was any phone calls going, anything going on behind that firewall, if you drop all state tables, um, they may not reestablish without hanging up first because everything kind of has to be renegotiated. And if we go over here to the firewall log, 192.168, 3.18 my laptop and because we told it to block the SSH and we filtered it so we said uh, show me the blocks show me the destination part of 22 because we had turned that rule off and now there's denies but because we have it allowed again and we'll go back over here cannot connect and we go make sure actually let me double check make sure I got the rule enabled so firewall rules oh didn't hit apply all right so now this is enabled again go back over here and we're logged right back in. Pretty straightforward in terms of that. Once you, you know, had it grayed out, hit it again, it's re-enabled. Now this is a linked rule back over to the NAT, like I had said, so I could have disabled the NAT rule, but either way, you kind of get the concept on the firewall rule of how to do that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is when you're trying to troubleshoot things in that broader sense, that's where you can also use PFTOP to help like pivot through any of this. And actually, let me get too many tabs open. All right, and we're back over here at PFTOP. We're focusing on host 192.168.40.129. So we focused on that. We focused on the protocol TCP, so we've narrowed down what we want to look at on this, or we could even focus on UDP. It's as simple as that, so we can see where things are going on this. So you can focus on even ICMP. So what about pinging things? So you can actually, there's no pings going on, but let's go in here and ping google.com. And away we go, we've got some ICMP traffic on there. Now this is also where you want to look at the rules and let's uh, go back over here, firewall rules, we'll open a new tab so we can keep that open over there. We're gonna look at the LAN because that's where this is located and we're gonna add a block rule. And we don't want ICMP traffic. We say, you know what, no one should be able to ping on this network. So we're gonna block it, block it on LAN, doesn't matter where it's going, it's just straight up blocked. So we go over here, hit apply. So IPv4, IGMP. Nope, we're not going to do it. What? I meant ICMP. I chose the wrong one. Glad I caught that. And it does even have the options here for subtypes if you have like only block the echo reply or however you want to do it. So we're going to hit save, apply. So now we have this default block that. So we go over here and it does resolve doesn't allow ping to come through. So now that's being blocked. And if we look over here, we see no ping. But if we drop all this and we look at what the host does. So right now we have, it's got port 53 and we'll actually see when I shrink this down a little bit. Each time you go to ping a new place, it's gonna make a new established connection. So let's actually ping like, you can see each of these port 53 DNS um, queries going through. So each one of those starts. And like I said, this gives you that diagnostic you're looking for. You go, all right, I see it doing this. It goes out to port 53, but there's no pings coming back. There's no ICMP traffic going back. So then you can go, what do the rules look like? And we can see that. Now, one more example is going to be, we'll go here. And if we move this down to the bottom, like I said, so rules are out of order, essentially. I said, hey, block it. But because there's an allow above, take a second to reload here. There we go. The rules are reloaded. There's a moment pause. Uh, that's why it says when you do this, it says monitor the filter reload process. And it just lets you know when it's done. If you have a lot of rules and you, depending on speed of your firewall, it'll take a second to go through here. But now we've done that, but that means we can now go back to pinging. ICMP traffic goes across. We go over here to the diagnostics and hey, look, here's all that traffic, ICMP traffic and proto ICMP. 
Now we can watch what's going across there. So all these get you an idea of how to get the firewall rules started, how to get them going, and start drilling down in there. So for each one you create, you need to create at least some allow rule to allow it to go somewhere. A couple other tips. When you're creating these allow rules, when you create a new interface, because let's say you want a guest, you don't want it to have access to the other ones, that's that de uh, deny where it was an inverted deny saying, hey, you can go anywhere but land. I have another video I'll link to where I dive a little bit more in that. One important rule, you cannot block access to the firewall itself. You can block access to ports on a firewall, such as the web interface. But I've seen people try to say, I don't want us to be able to access the firewall. Well, the firewall is the gateway. It has to get out. So devices on that network do have to get out. So that's another mistake I see a lot of people make when they're doing it is they go, well, I denied access to the firewall for security. And I'm like, no, you need to allow it to the firewall. You also need to, unless you have another solution, allow DNS. And you can do that where you can block DNS on there if you want, block port 53. But if you block port 53, um, overall, now it can't do any DNS, and now you've also broken the hosts on there that rely on DNS, unless they have another method by which to resolve names. So you have to be careful on what you block on there. It is important to block the web interface on those extra interfaces, but not all of it. And using PFTOP and the firewall log rules and just checking a little log box on there to turn on logging to help troubleshoot those rules to see if there's even a log file of them or if there's anything being established that helps you a lot with whether or not you have just a basic networking problem on the host side, a greater problem where it is going through the firewall but not establishing on the other end, and whether or not that traffic's returning. And those are all the tools you use to diagnose. So check your logs, always go through there. Go ahead and turn it on for a reverse sort order, which like I said, I wish was the default. That's very helpful, so they're always at the top. And use a little filter icon at the top to help narrow down, because once you have this in an established network with a lot of connections, PFSense does a great job of allowing you to filter it. But if you were to just look at like our connections at any given moment, there's thousands of these little state tables created. So it can be a little bit daunting at first, but that's what those little filters are for. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.